Thank you very much. Um, to begin with, I would like everyone to put their hands together for everyone in a purple shirt, all the volunteers putting together this whole thing. One of the weirdest things that happened to me last year was the Slack channel. I contribute regularly to WordPress Core, the WordPress open source project, Eurovision weekend, which in our household is called the happiest weekend of the year. <laughs> and I'd opened up Slack, and there was a message from one of the WordPress lead developers. Helen Husandi, one of the developers who I most admire in the world, had sent a message asking to talk to me. Because the devil inside me tells me that I'm not a good developer, I immediately thought I'd screwed up somehow, stood on someone's toes or something like that, and done something wrong. I couldn't think what it was, but I nervously replied, really, just to get anything out of the way and try and enjoy Eurovision weekend, the happiest weekend of the year. <laughs> the message that came back was quite different. The message that came back was an invite to be a guest committee for the pro project. At home, this led to pandemonium. I started yelling, what the hell, type noises to my partner who dared to answer, so I immediately told him to shut up. <laughs> my inner monologue told me that I'm not a good developer, but I was in a good mood. I mean, it was Eurovision weekend. <laughs> so I pretty much made the decision on impulse to accept. I mentioned this because I've always considered myself a front-end developer. When I go for jobs, I focus on my skill set as a front-end developer. By way of comparison, the people who make WordPress write the software that powers a significant portion of the internet. You might want to call this imposter syndrome. This came several months after I was lucky enough to get a job at a company that I admired called Human Made. Although I was so convinced in the hours leading up to the job offer that I was not going to get a job offer, that I started messaging people and starting to, started to, to arrange backup options. This too could be called imposter syndrome. Wikipedia defines imposter syndrome like this. A concept describing high achieving individuals marked by an inability to internalize their accomplishments and a persistent fear of being exposed as a fraud. Which is pretty dry. I prefer something much more direct. Imposter syndrome is that internal voice telling you that despite objective success, you're shit at your job. <laughs> and it's not a new problem. One of the American founding fathers would write to his wife questioning his fitness for the task at hand, for his fitness to do the job. This is biographer Ron, Ron Chenow describing these letters. And I really like this quote for its directness. I think the key phrase is the unspoken melancholy of the prodigy. Put it another way, the more you know, the more you know you don't know. Now this person was active in the 80s, the 1780s, but his decisions affect day-to-day -day lives. What's his name? Alexander Hamilton. His name is Alexander Hamilton. Two years after his father left at age 10, he and his mother got sick. Alex got better, but his mother went quick. He moved in with a cousin, and then the cousin committed suicide. This is someone who has every reason to suffer insecurities. Now, I'd argue that his greatest achievement was to go on and inspire Hamilton the musical, which <laughs> I'm ever so slightly obsessed with right now. But he actually went on to become decorated and the first Treasury Secretary to President Washington. For better or worse, the system, and sometimes worse, the system that Alexander and the other founding fathers um, set up continues to affect our day-to-day -day lives to this very day. And despite his hometown, he suffered the same fate as many of us. Because he was surrounded by super talented people, he suffered imposter syndrome. And it's those dark places that I would like to talk about today. The nature of these talks require uh, allowing you into the speaker's dark places. The nature of these talks require confessing to thoughts that the speaker would rather keep to themselves. 
The nature of these talks require dropping the veneer of confidence and to allow the self-doubt to shine. The nature of these talks asks something of you as an audience too. They ask you to acknowledge that. As an aside, and a little bit meta, I was a little worried writing this talk. I got nervous. I was unsure that I'd be able to fulfill my promise to deliver it. And I've delivered talks before, many times. I basically got imposter syndrome in the process of writing my talk on imposter syndrome. <laughs> There's a reason why I've asked you to acknowledge the nature of these talks, and it's the reason I got nervous. Usually, Peter Wilson, self-confident character based on my life, presents these talks. But today, the real me is, in, uh, is presenting with all my human flaws. Today, I'll be talking about imposter syndrome from the perspective of a developer. For developers, there is an increasing number of tools to learn. In, um, new frameworks are being developed for existing uh, tools. New tools are being developed for existing languages. And it's the same for other web professionals, be it marketers, writers, illustrators. And I'm sure it's the same in other industries too. But I can't talk to any of that. I can only talk to my experience as a developer. To my mind, web toxicity is a big contributor to imposter syndrome. A big part of the problem is being dismissive of people's skill as a developer. Instead of helping people, we tell them that they're not a real developer or that they're doing it wrong. In WordPress circles, the phrase, doing it wrong, is an almost celebrated insult. So much so that it's a function of the software itself. So much better would be a function for what it means, that the developer may be using a deprecated function or have a more efficient alternative available. The biggest problem with the toxicity of the web that is sometimes this whole you're not a real developer meme sort of starts trending on social media. The sentiment might boil down to something like this. You're not a real developer if you can't develop without tools. Or you're not a real developer if you use some of the most common software in use today. Now, I chose both of these tweets because they were um, quoting, someone, uh, quoting someone in a position of influence. So that is why I've anonymized them. But these claims that you're not a real developer are about as logical as claiming you're not a real developer unless you can optimize this JavaScript without converting it from its binary form. <laughs> it's ridiculous. It's obviously CSS. <laughs> if you can open your editor of charts and write code that works as you intend, you are a real developer. If you set up your editor with tools to make everything easier, you are a real developer. But it's more than that. You don't need the validation of randoms telling you what is or isn't real development. So they're the thoughts when I have, that I have when someone tries to tell me that I'm not a real developer. I consider it hogwash. But that's not the bit that sticks. What the bit that sticks is far more hurtful. What the devil inside me says is you're not a good developer. I mentioned during the introduction that these talks require removing the veneer of confidence. And these are my thoughts without it. I can see that objectively I'm successful. It's just that one day my career is bound to come tumbling around down around me. I've made this comment in front of rooms before. I see myself as a front-end developer who knows enough back-end to be dangerous. It was never entirely true, but rather a self-effacing way of saying that I became uh, a front-end developer, I started as a front-end developer before becoming a back-end developer. What is entirely true is that I came from the web, from the front-end, with my first book on web development being a first edition HTML for dummies back in 1995. What is also true is that I spend my days working with developers who have worked with good, honest, proper programming languages for their entire career. They most certainly didn't start with a programming for dummies book back in the mid-90s. On the other hand, I can recreate the blink tag in six lines of CSS. 
These days, I find myself writing far more PHP than anything else, but I spend a lot of time on Google looking up the documentation. My internal monologue loves to make a joke about being endorsed for guesswork on LinkedIn. Every now and then, one of the real devs will give me some good, honest, proper CSS to sink my teeth into. Because it's nice to have a pro proper front-end developer around when they're needed. My internal monologue rejoins that it's not worth wasting a real developer's time just to do the CSS. My inner monologue is a real bastard. Self-confident me tells the world that I love learning new things, especially when I make a newbie mistake and a code reviewer picks it up without judgment. Imposter me still thinks that I'm making a newbie mistake. So that's the kind of thinking that goes into imposter syndrome. And I'm not going to make anyone put up their hands, but I'm willing to bet heavily that some of you recognised a bit of yourself in there. Which begs the question, how to manage imposter syndrome? Clear Left is one of the leading um, digital agencies globally. They're leaders when it comes to front-end development, and they have a really simple approach to knowledge sharing within their office. They have a skills board. I can look at this board, and I can see that if I want to know anything about responsive images, I go to Mark. I can see that if I want to know about media queries inside responsive SVGs, I go to Charlotte. I love this, the idea of this board for a lot of reasons. It's as smart as it is simplistic. The skills board says there is an expectation of learning on the job. It says that there are skills you will need to do your job that you do not know yet. Go off, learn them, and when you're done, jot a note on the skills board when you're finished with your learning. The expectation of learning, though, is not the important bit. The most important bit is the reverse of the coin the expectation of ignorance. It is saying, you have the ability to do this. You just don't know the messy details yet. The logic of development, be it front-end or back-end, is far more uh, important than any one particular detail. Looking at this board, I really love that it's held together with sticky tape and post-it notes. It's a lot like knowledge itself. One of the reasons I feel like an imposter is because I don't know stuff off the top of my head. I need to look it up. A while ago on Twitter, there was what I, my internal monologue dubbed the you're a real developer if meme. Senior developers with experience were posting their not so guilty secrets about how they work. A Google lead confessing to looking up how to get a string's length in Python every single time they need to do it. Or real developers confessing to copying things off Stack Overflow. I said earlier you don't need the validation of randoms on Twitter telling you what is or isn't real development. However, when hundreds of people are sharing, and it was hundreds of people, their experiences as a developer as being less than perfect, it's a valuable reminder that you can be too. My morning routine is to open my text editor and then immediately open Dash so I have the documentation just to mouse click away. It seems this is just good practice despite what my inner monologue is saying. So what does this mean? How does this help manage the imposter? Knowing others work the same way on its own doesn't help. You need to use that to stamp down the inner monologue trying to undermine you. How can you do this? If writing 3D transforms on a post-it note to remind yourself that you can do something helps, do it. If you work alone, you might just want to jot it down in the back of your notebook. I use Twitter a fair bit, so I went through and favourited a bunch of these tweets to remind myself that a lot of developers are working the same way I am. I've decided that, for me at least, there's probably no getting over imposter syndrome completely. And I expect the same is true for most people. So the best anyone can hope to do is persevere with the veneer of confidence and build up techniques to help work around their imposter. I hope you'll bear with me as I go back to my latest obsession, Hamilton the Musical. 
A good deal of the opening act is centered around the American Revolution, the War of Independence. All of which the revolutionaries effectively won independence, both in fact and in fiction, was the Battle of Yorktown. Of course, recall this from the 2016 Tony Awards. <laughs> One of Hamilton's mates, Hercules Mulligan, infiltrates the British as a spy. In the fictionalised version, he returns victorious to Yorktown with this rap. See, that's what happened so when you're up against the ruffians. We're in the shit now, somebody's got to shovel it. Hercules Mulligan, I need no introduction. When you knock me down, I get the fuck back up again. For whatever reason, someday, imposter syndrome will knock you down. The best advice I can offer doesn't come on the day, it comes the day after. Be a ruffian, get the fuck back up again. Some days you're in a monologue will make this hard to do. Other days you'll be able to swap out the self-doubt for self-confidence. But there's a problem with that advice. Just get up again is terrible advice. Just get up again. Just get up again. Bad, bad, bad advice. So I'm going to try and explain a bit what I mean with another Hamilton reference. Although this time, a different Hamilton. Margaret Hamilton. I'm going to talk about the first software engineer, the person who wrote the software to get man on the moon, Margaret Hamilton. I'm sure you've all seen this photo. This is Hamilton standing next to a printout of the navigation software she and her team wrote for the Apollo project. Early on during the Apollo missions, Hamilton thought that the software and the engineers that wrote it weren't getting this taken seriously as a discipline. They weren't dealing with, you're not a real developer. They were dealing with, you're not doing a real job. To counter this, Margaret Hamilton started referring to herself and her team as software engineers. She defined the term software engineering. Giving yourself a title, be it reminding yourself that you are a software engineer, or using a culture reference as a reference tool to help suppress your dis um, disbelief in yourself is the trick to remind yourself you have the knowledge and to bring that knowledge to the surface. In East of Eden, Sam Hamilton calls it doing a magic. Playing mind games with yourself to swap self-doubt for self-confidence. Does that make sense to you? No. It makes no sense to me either. But it works and it helps me to stop feeling like an imposter. I hope you can find something that works for you too. Thank you very much.